welcome to Fiber Trek. My name is Sarah. This is episode 64. Thank you so much for tuning in and welcome to new and returning viewers. I really appreciate you taking some time to invest in the podcast content and support the work that is happening amongst everybody who is participating in the conversations here. Primarily, you will find on this podcast lots of gray yarn and lots of conversations about place and lots of conversations about people and community and the way that place, land, and those people and community interact. I've got a couple cool yarns to talk to you about today along those lines. I have a f works in progress. I have acquisitions and discoveries, announcements. I have a special guest and, and then probably a fond farewell. Not, not too long today. Um, I happen to find myself home from work and it's a rather uh, dreek and dreary day and I'm here on the floor with my dogs and my wood stove. This thing is like super duper warm. I probably have to take this off. And Koei is right behind here, my big Anatolian. So the camera moves, it's, it's Ko. Uh, so did I welcome you? I, I always have that moment where I'm like, what did I say? But if I have not, you are most welcome here and I hope that you are well and in good spirits. I am wearing, in case you're wondering, because I'm probably going to take it off, <laughs> this is uh, Heidi Kermeyer, and it is Long Winter's Day, or Winter's Day. I knit this out a of a Maine Romney from the Winterport area. It's got this big um, turtleneck, which is supposed to fold over, but I was cold, and so I had everything kind of bundled up, and now I'm not. But I knit this, and my mom loved it so much, and I'm going to take it off, um, that I gave it to her, and then... She is always, she's like, I'm always so hot, so she never wears it, so I've kind of taken it back. Um, and it's got this really great textured stitch, um, and it's held up really well. Um, it's super big. You can see the different grays. If there was ever a case for the grays are all different, right? So this is the same yarn, and you can see that strip of lighter gray right along the bottom. And then that beautiful, just nice textured stitch. I think I've talked about this on the podcast when I knit it a couple years ago. So anyway, that is Winter's Day by Heidi Kermeyer. I'm pretty sure it's Heidi Kermeyer. And I would knit that again, and I have a, like a Shetland, California red yarn uh, breed cross that I got at Maryland uh, three years ago, two years ago? Just about three years ago, I guess. Um, and it's really... Structured. It's really like, um, that's what I'm looking for. I can't think of it. But I think this is a little bit more draped to it because of the long wool. But I think that would be like a really nice kind of stout uh, sweater. So anyway, I'm going to put up here. So I'm getting dog hair on it. Well, already has dog hair on it. Right. Works in progress. Works in progress. Acquisitions and discoveries. Special guest announcements. A fond farewell. That's our day today. Uh, if you're listening and tuning in, the sweater I just described was all gray. Are you surprised? Probably not. With kind of a moss stitch texture all over and turtleneck. Right, so the first work I have for you will look very familiar, of course. <laughs> it is Nanook by Heidi Kermeyer. I'm knitting this out of Lean In, which is a story-based yarn from Jennifer Goyer of uh, Wild Lily Artisan Fibers. She's also the wool manager for Anna Rune's Sheep Company. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about her work um, and getting a visual of the ranch at Anna Runes and the yarns and the operation, then you can head over to Melissa Littlefield of Knitting the Stash. Uh. <laughs> Knitting the Stash. She has a, a podcast on YouTube and she also has a written blog. But she got to visit Jennifer, and she details her time with her and uh, all of the uh, fun wool skirting and yarns, etc. Jennifer just released her second yarn in that story-based yarn group, and it's called Begin, and I think it's a Lincoln lamb. It's stunning. I showed it on the podcast a couple weeks ago. It's all white, so if you were lucky, you could dye with it. Um, anyway, I've got one skein, and I... Not 100% sure what I'm going to do with it yet, but I'm more than happy to hold on to it and covet it for the rest of my life and squish it and squeeze it and love it, kiss it and hug it and name it George. Um, let's see. 
All right, so I'm going to go back to the sweater. This is uh, Nanook. It is knit from the top down. Lean In is a beautiful oatmeal, light oatmeal brown, and this has a gorgeous lace collar. Um, it's, a, it's a bear claw, so a series of kind of um, undul undulating shells that run the entire length of the neckline. It has like a waterfall effect, so when you put it on, the, uh, the lace kind of hangs down and the sweater gets a little bit lower, the body of the sweater. So knit from the top down, all of your increases are made along the back in kind of a spiral, half moon shape. This includes your arms. The front panels are knit in a garter stitch. The back is knit in a stockinette. I have finished both arms. I knit them both in the round. It's recommended in the pattern to knit them flat so you stay on gauge. I wasn't too worried about that. So I knit them in the round. And when I picked up the stitches, when I joined the underarm of the stitch to the underarm of the body, you pick up and knit along <clears throat> your cast on edge of your sleeves. And I picked up and knit double the stitches recommended because I want a larger size in the upper arm and I did not decrease as often. So I kind of have a bigger um, sleeve and, um, and then I just made up for those stitches at the bottom. I just kind of decreased 10 randomly across before I knit the cuff. Cuff set in a garter in a rib, and I just need to knit down. So anyway, I've been really excited about the way that this construction has unfolded because I wasn't one hundred percent sure how it was going to, and it was a real case of just trusting the pattern and doing exactly what the pattern said. And it did force me to do some do, to conceptualize some of the technique or some of the movement I was going to have to make, and that was fun to kind of like try to manipulate the knitting in my brain, which I don't do very often. I'm kind of a, oh, that's what the pattern says, that's what I'm going to do. And when I had to change to knitting in the round, I was like, how am I going to pick up the sleeves and make that all connect? And so that was a nice exercise for my little brain to manipulate uh, shapes and images. I don't do very well with that. So Nanook, Heidi Kermeyer, Lean In from Wild Lily Artisan Fibers. I'm also working on the Busta Beanie by Gudrun Johnston. She's the patron designer for uh, Shetland Wool Week. I always want to say patron saint of Shetland Wool Week, but she's the pa patron designer. Uh, the Busta Beanie is a, <clears throat> is a hat, obviously, and I'm knitting this in Jameson in Shetland. And you're probably having to put sunglasses on right now because this podcast is usually all gray or natural colored. And you'll see that I picked a really deep, rusty brown, um, orangey brown for the main dark, and like a lavender brown, like a light lavender brown for the light. And then I picked this gold, like just gold, not even heathered gold, mustard gold, uh, for a pop of color. This has like undulating waves that run up and down vertically along the hat. I've made my way to the second decrease in the crown, and I'm thinking it's going to be a bit too slouchy for my taste. I haven't decided if I'm going to rip it out and start decreasing sooner. I am running out of my main dark, that rusty color. I don't think it's going to make it. But I have some Starcroft tie, which is a really nice substitute for this Jameson and Smith. I think this is a jumper. This is Jameson and Smith two-ply jumper weight. So the, the Tide is a really nice substitute for that, and I have it in a deep dark brown. I also have it in green, so I might be able to finish just do the top in a green. And So anyway, I haven't decided what I'm going to do, which is part of the reason I probably haven't finished it yet, because I've been contemplating it a little bit as to how I want to proceed. So that is knit. Uh, that is the Boost of Eating by Gudrun Johnston. And I will say this. I think my gauge um, is off a little because I was picking, and I talked about this a little bit in my last podcast, so I'm throwing and picking at the same time, and this, I think sometimes my picking hand, I tend to get a little bit more yarn into the stitch, and so it makes it a little bit bigger than my, throwing, my thrower. Um, so I think that's part of the reason, too, that I ran out of that rusty Shetland. I think she does recommend two skeins of the dark, but I didn't read that far ahead. I just ordered my yarn. And so now I'm going to have to get creative. 
So that's all I've really been working on for knitting. I did put some time into my niece's Owlette sweater, um, and I'm just knitting gray Cascade Eco on size US 11. Uh, I did knit the Nanook on a US 7, and I'm knitting the, excuse me, I am knitting the Bustavini on a US 2. So I just, the gray sleeve isn't really that interesting. But hopefully that sweater will make its way to be, it's almost done, I finished the sleeves, so something interesting to show you. I forgot to mention that I, in the agenda, that I have a bit of spinning. I've been working on the Eloise fleece. This is a Shetland fleece I picked up at Rhinebeck. Is that going to focus for you? And this was a project I'm doing with Emily of Fibertown, Sarah of Yarns at Yanhu, and Claire of New Hampshire Knits. We all split that fleece, we're all spinning it, preparing it individually, and then we were going to talk a little bit about and compare, you know, just how different spinners approach different materials and different fibers, and what you experience on a fleece is not the same as somebody else might experience. So um, I think that Claire and I are in the caboose on this project. <laughs> I, uh, I find that here, I'm at my parents in southern Maine, feels a little different with my wheel. I have my shocked sidekick <clears throat> and I have a Lendrum at my home in northern Maine. And the Lendrum is set up so like there's a stool and I can just slip in and slip out. It's really easy to just kind of sit down and spin and get up and sit down and spin and get up. But this is not so much the same setup here. So anyway, it felt good to kind of get my hands back on this and I get really inspired when I see other people spinning. So I think that watching um, Rachel of Welford Pearls and or the Woolen Spinning Podcast, Emily of Fibertown, of course, and um, yeah, I think it was just kind of like, yeah, I, I enjoy all of that discussion that comes down the pike on these great podcasts, some of which I hadn't mentioned, but I, you know, it's good. It, it's motivating for me, so it got me going. So acquisitions and discoveries. I had a lovely package arrive from Ireland. This was Kate of Hawthorne Cottage Craft. She went to Edinburgh Yarn Festival and sent me a lovely, um, what's the word, consolation uh, package, prize. It wasn't a prize, she sent me a lovely gift, consolation gift. I didn't get to go, obviously. I am bound to determine that I will make it to Edinburgh Yarn Festival in 2018, that's my year. But in the meantime, this little taste uh, was excellent and I, was really amazed and surprised when I opened the package. So first she sent me one of her lovely bags. She has these in her shop, Hawthorne Cottage Craft. They're really nice, you can fold them down. They have quite a bit of structure to them. So there must be like a, some sort of interfacing or quilting batting in there. Um, so you can fold them over, they're boxed on the bottom and <clears throat> have your little bucket. What I really like about this is that there's no zip and just has the snaps. And then the best part of that is it can it will fold down. So you kind of get double security. So thank you so much, Kate. So this is a lovely job, a lovely piece of handwork, um, or sewing work, I should say. She also sent me um, some Iona wool. And it's so funny because I saw this uh, frequently being featured on a number of different feeds from Edinburgh Yarn Festival. And I, I just have a thing for sheep and islands. And... I don't know if ever since Orkney, I mean, I worked on an island in Lake Champlain with sheep. I've been tied in and had a wonderful time with Nash Island. You've got Orkney, and I just have always been drawn to those two concepts, island places and wool. And so here we have Iona featured. This wool is a, um, it's called an origin yarn. That's, what, that's what's on the label. It's all the fleeces are sorted and um, skirted from fleeces in Iona. And the, the breeds featured here include Hebridean, Swartables, Texel, and Suffolk, and then Mule, which is a tip, like a cross of different breeds. So there's a very specific smell about this wool, which takes me right back to the kitchen in Orkney, and I don't know what it is, but it's a very visceral response that I had when I picked this up, and I smelled it. I was like... Like this, I just wanted a really strong mug of tea, and I wanted a digestive biscuit, and I wanted to be slightly cold, because the kitchen and um, 
the, it's just damp and windy and orkney and eaty and so you know my feet were always kind of cold and so anyway I was like oh I just want that feeling back um, I just want to be there right now and I could be thanks to um, this wonderful gift so Iona is I can tell you a little bit about Iona all right let me see if I can bring up some information for you um, Silence is golden, right? So Iona is a small island in the Inner Hebrides off the Ross of Mull on the western coast of, Stop of Scotland, and it was the center of Gallic monasticism for four centuries and is today renowned for its tranquility and natural beauty. Islands are the way to go. Small, rugged, remote islands with very little population. It has my name all over it. I was thrilled to... Uh, to receive these um, in the mail and add them to my island collection. And just like most things, I would love to get this on my needles. I'd love to finish the Bustabini and put this right onto the needles, but if it doesn't make it there, I'm happy to covet it and just admire it sitting in my stash. No problem with that. So another acquisition that I received was my, my Inspired by Isla book. Um, this was put out by Kate Davies and her husband. Um, Tom did all of the um, all of the photography. I joined this club when she initially published it, and part of that club was you received the pattern downloads, you received the essays, and then at the end you received everything compositely in a book. And I had talked about my next cast on. I'm thinking it's going to be this, the OA by. Kate Davies from this collection, and I got the Old Centrum yarn to do that. I just have a few pieces to work out. I talked about that a couple episodes ago. And just, again, Kate never fails in providing the most enriching content and, of course, stunning design. The photography is inspiring and rugged and dramatic. Um, there's discussion of Isla Scotch. Um, which is one of my favorite uh, single malts. Uh, it's very, um, it's very smoky, and it has like a little overwash of iodine to it. It's a very kind of seaweed, medicinal taste. Um, I'm hoping I'm getting that right, um, Keith Nuscraft. And uh, yeah, so I, um, I'm gonna spend some time with Kate in the evenings. Hey, right, so I think we're ready for our special guest. Um, I'm hoping that he's still willing to come on over here. I'm looking at him right now. He's not only going to talk about his knitting, he is going to talk a little bit about his, what, double-headed axe sharpening, hun? Double bit. Double bit? Well, why don't you come over and tell us a little bit about it? Right, so hopefully you will recognize Rob the Ranger. Um, from Ranger Knits. He has finished. Did you ever talk about finishing your sweater on the podcast? I can't remember. I can't remember either. Anyway, he, he knit his first sweater. He knit the cobblestone by Jared Flood mm -hmm. out of Nash Island light. And now you're going to, under much coercion, knit an Icelandic yoke sweater. Yeah. Um, Attempt. Attempt. <laughs> I was like, you should knit an Icelandic yoke. And he was like, no. And I'm like, you should knit an Icelandic yoke. And he was like, no. And I was like, you should knit the Rodari. And then somehow you ended up saying yes. Because you bought the yarn for me. Oh, I bought the yarn for you. <laughs> uh, we picked up the yarn from the Woolly Thistle. And let's see. Um, what was I bringing up? Here. Oh, I wanted to bring up what the Rodari looked like. So this was a gift all around, lots of gift giving, and let's see. This is the Rodari that Rob is going to knit. You may recognize it. Um, Pia Camaborn knit it for her, um, her Dennis, and Maria of Ninja Chickens just finished it for her Toby, and so you're going to knit it yourself. And we've got Moss. Frostbite, and um, this one is, is that one frostbite? shade. Um, I have to look on that. Yeah, 
gray. I can't read really <laughs> that. Like light gray. And then we have a darker green. And we have a darker green coming from the well, like thistle that's yep. got to come in. So that's the Radari, and you've cast on, haven't you? Cast on a sleeve. So that's it. That's our, those are not US 7s. No, these are 4s. Oh, okay. Or three and three and a half, three yeah. Three, three and, and a half, half millimeter. Three and a half, yeah. And then and then you do that for the cuff, and then you. Oh, this okay, out, good. So. I'm glad he's read, read the I pattern. Read the, I read the directions. Good job, honey. And you even asked for help. I know I've cast on. I'm <laughs> super impressed. So this is a little unknitting knitting related, but I'm sure Rob will keep you up to date on his radari. But we're we have, we're a bit stymied because of we were like, oh, we'll cast it on, we'll get the sleeves done, and we'll knit up the body and. Like the first thing we have to do is a, a color work band on the cuffs and... After four rows. So yeah, I can't really progress yeah. too far. So we were like, wah, wah. But you have other projects. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your other project? Yeah. So one of my, my current projects that I've worked on, now they've come down to Southern Maine for a visit and uh, have the benefit of a two-bay garage woodworking shop with everything you might ever want and never even having to leave the house on a rainy, <laughs> snowy day like yesterday. So, um, I've just recently acquired a antique double bit axe. So I've been working on this. It's going to be a great canoe axe for us for our canoe trips. And I'm basically replacing this handle. So this is a piece of hickory. That, this podcasting setup might not no work out. No guillotines. No guillotines. So this, this is the original one. And there's several cracks in it. One right here, a couple other spots. And, and it's got some rot up here at the tip. So basically I've taken, uh, a blank piece of wood that was in the shape, rough shape, of a double bit axe, but it was too big. And I've been working in the workshop yesterday and a little bit this morning, reshaping it. And uh, only one minor accident with the draw knife, but I didn't lose my <laughs> didn't entire finger. stitches. It was band-aid worthy. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's been my project. I have drew out a pattern last night. Um, so when I get home back up north, I'm going to take some leather. And make a leather sheath for it for the double bit. And why the double bit versus just is that a broadhead axe that's just got the single blade on it? No, well, versus it's, a it, hatchet. It's or? just a different style axe. So traditionally, the double bit axe was used when they did um, trail work and things like that. You had one axe that had a, a very narrow, sharp profile, and the other was a little bit um, steeper of an angle, so that you could cut stumps and rocks. Not rocks. <laughs> you could cut That's stumps amazing. and roots, yeah. um, and then you would have still a very sharp edge for limbing and, and cutting branches and things oh, like that. Okay, that so, makes sense. You'd have to keep switching tools, right. even though you, your materials were different. Right. So one handle, you could have two tools. So you could have a grubbing axe here, and then, then a finer axe for, for, for felling. Right. So. so I noticed that on here there's some pitting, Rob. Yep. That's just because it's, it's probably... Oh, that's backwards. So... It's a two and a half pound um, cruiser axe, so it's a lightweight axe, and I'm trying to figure out the age of it, but I'm guessing probably somewhere in the 60 to 80 year old range, so um, yeah, eBay. double bit axes um, are, are, are a lot of fun. So. Um, and then my only other question is, is, did you sharpen it yet, or did it I come have. sharpened? Yep, yep. I'm starting to sharpen it. It's not quite razor sharp yet, but I need to finish the handle, so before I um, get it too sharp. And it, it looks like you've got something mapped out here like what yeah are i have reference marks i've been using taking the the old handle that i wanted and a pair of dividers and taking measurements off that to try and mimic the shape so i know how much i have to shave down and then on the pommel end of it i've started to put a little bit of a of a swell here um so that it'll catch your hand oh, right, and not yeah. slide off and i'm probably going to cut it down and do another one a, a pommel swell down here so it's a shorter length to match the original handle. Cool. So. And what gave you the impetus for this idea? Like, why were you all of a sudden all about the double-headed axe? And I, you know, I had a double bit axe when I was a kid. We had one around the farm working on stuff, and and uh, I haven't had one since. So I probably have a dozen axes, but you know. That might be an understatement. Just a dozen. Well, if you include hatchets and tomahawks right. and everything else, probably, probably <laughs> hatchets a lot and tomahawks. More. Yeah. So, um, cool. Yeah. So it's just just a project to work on. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. I'll be curious to see how the the leather um, sheath yep. comes out. Yep. We'll dye Maybe that we can tool put, some of that. Like we'll do. I'll let you do that. I'll do the copper rivets and stitching, and then you can okay. stamp it and tool it. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Thanks for coming on for a little while today, just yeah. to kind of liven up the old fiber 
conversation with a little axe conversation and just a few different, you know, traditional skills, traditional projects that are happening around our house for sure. Yeah. So. And um, tapping trees. You're tapping trees. As we speak. Yep. So the getting, sap getting is some running. Syrup, so. Maple syrup and. Um, yep. We we're we're not on our regularly scheduled program this year, are we? We've got yeah. we got some stuff going on and it requires us to be a little bit more flexible. As I tell my kids, we can have rock brain, or we can have flexible brain, and we're trying to have flexible brain about um, where we're being pulled, yeah. which is hanging out with a dog. So. Well, I look forward to hearing some more about your new and upcoming announcements yeah. that you have to talk about. Oh, what a so. nice lead-in. You're, you're such a natural at this podcasting. So do you want to stick around while I talk about that, or do you, do you want to go back and... I'll go back to what I was working okay. on. Okay, so. I'll let you go do that. Then. Okay, All right. thanks. Thanks. So what Rob was alluding to so adeptly um, is that... This is the announcement portion. I am... Releasing a retreat. I, I have done retreats in the past. This uh, set of retreats that I'm working on is my own fiber track retreat. And they're called Wool Scout Retreats. They exemplify adventure, land, uh, landscape, and wool. And the first one that I'm going to be doing is going to be at Bradford Camps. It's going to be August 13th through the 17th. And I'm doing this um, and hosting with Mary Jane Mucklestone. And Jenny Estelle of Starcroft Fiber. Uh, my hope is that Sarah of Upton Yarns will be there. Uh, she's been working on her boat schedule. The, ca the owners of the camp, Igor and Karen Skorsky, are generously all also offering up their skill sets. Igor is going to offer orienteering and fly casting. I'm going to be teaching flint and steel fires as well as... Um, I haven't quite decided yet. I wanted to kind of see what the interest was, but I can teach basic tracking, uh, track identification. We could do basic paddling techniques. I am a registered Maine guide, and that allows me in this state to, to guide people on um, wilderness trips. Wilderness means, um, and this, when, this trip in particular is not wilderness, but uh, it means that you're spending a night um, without potable water. Right, Rob? Yeah, so I have other trips lined up for that. I will be hoping hoping to lead, uh, co-lead with a friend of mine, Bob Myron of the Outdoor Leadership School of America. Outdoor Leaders of America, actually Outdoor Leaders of America um, is his program. He actually trains guides around the world. And he and I have been talking about doing something together for a while, and I thought it would be fun to do a Wool Scout retreat on the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. So that will be a six-day canoe trip. Uh, and that will be in 2018. So 2017 is the Bradford Camps uh, retreat, and 2018 is more of a wilderness retreat, so that's an Allagash paddling retreat, and I have a couple other things up my sleeve for 2018, so stay tuned for that, Fiber Truck Wool Scouts. But in the meantime, 2017, Bradford Camps, Mary Jane Mucklestone, um, I was going on a little bit about the wilderness classes, but there'll also be other knitterly type classes. Uh, I know Janie of Stell will be, um, we're going to do a workshop on Viking chatelaines, which is a traditional tool that w Viking women use to put all of their mending supplies and it kind of hung from your belt. And so we'll be making one of those and there'll be goodie bags and knitting and amazing food. The one thing about this camp is it is in the deep, woods of northern Maine. Access is really by float plane. It's highly encouraged. You can drive to this camp. It's over 70 plus miles on working logging roads and it's like highly recommended that you have a vehicle that can manage that type of terrain and you've got a spare tire and a high lift jack and all of those things. So float plane is probably really the way to go. You could fly either from Bangor uh, the Catan Air Service will do a service from Bangor or from Millinocket. You can catch flights from either place. And when you fly in, it's on Munsungan Lake, and it is the only structure on that lake, that wilderness um, setting. And all of the food is provided for. Um, lodging is shared, and there are cabins, and they have ensuite um, bathrooms with hot and cold running water and flush toilets. So. No compromises kind of made on the plumbing, but more on connection. So no Wi-Fi, no cell service, um, no electricity as far as uh, 
the cabins go. So those are all propane lights. But a pretty stunning landscape and a pretty amazing place to land or lean in. And that's kind of where all of this conversation has been leading to the past couple weeks. So that's the Fiber Trek Wool Scouts. You can see more about that on my aspiring website, fiber trek dot squarespace dot com and that's where you'll be able to sign up that will release april 8th which is my birthday uh, so registration will open that day cost is 1478 dollars that includes everything workshop materials classes tax gratuity meals lodging does not include transportation and um, and i'll be there and Janie will be there and mary jane mucklestone will be there and igor and karen will be there to welcome you um, this is a limited number um, that we can we can serve so if you're really interested you're welcome to contact me right now if you need more information but that like I said will go live April 8th at 8 a.m. on my website barring any issues of e-commerce so that's all kind of new to me so uh, if you don't uh, have time to make that happen this summer you can certainly join me in the fall for Highlands on the Fly that's October 20 third the 27th I think it's right before Halloween it's the last weekend in October and that I will be hosting Jen Steingas who is a prolific sweater designer she does beautiful yokes she's from Maine and she's gonna come and do our keynote talk on Friday night that uh, retreat is Thursday night through Sunday it includes all of your meals your lodging workshops uh, and there's a nice marketplace that happens there on Saturday. This keynote speech is not included in the price that is listed. You can find out more about that through the New England Outdoor Center. You can find out about that on my website. You can find out about that on the Ravelry page, or you can certainly contact me and I can point you in the right direction. The last retreat that I'm doing this year is going to be the Bold Coast retreat that's happening in Machiasport, Maine. I think I have one place left in that retreat. There's two sessions of that. It's the week of July 17th through the July 22nd. And I think that there's room in the latter half. You can see more about registering for that on onelupin.com under events, and you can register right through that site. So Bold Coast, Hounds on the Fly, Wool Scout Retreat. Um, if you're looking for a little adventure this summer um, or this fall, Perhaps one of those might float your plane. <laughs> so you will also find on my new website uh, when my, my yarn will be released there. You'll be able to purchase through there. And you can also learn a little bit more about the show. I've been in contact with my videographer, my creative partner, and he and I are getting ready to amp up and ramp up the Fiber Trek vlogazine and take that to the next level. So wish us luck on that. and. We'll see how it goes. In the meantime, I think it's uh, a fond farewell. I really appreciate connecting with you. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you next time. Oh, I forgot. Wherever your fiber trucks may take you, may you return home safe and with lots of soulful stash. I'll see you next time. Bye.